Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, a podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 35, November 15th through November 21st, 1861. Before we get started, just a quick note, I'm going to have a Patreon episode come out here, and we are doing another movie review. This one's One Man's Hero. It's sort of fitting. We have uh, been going over the Mexican-American War, so there is a film that has some of the events that we talked about, circles around the San Patricios, who we we talked about uh, in our rundown of the conflict so be on the lookout for that if you are interested and check out the patreon feed last week we had an international incident of the trent affair kicking off a good couple of months of uneasy relations between the lincoln administration and england we also had some continuing actions in kentucky as both sides jostle for position in the battleground state This week, we will see what's going on in Oklahoma, where, as we have mentioned in the past, there will be a civil war of its own occurring in what was known as Indian Territory. We can wrap up the rest of today with some military operations on the frontier prior to the Civil War. November 19th, 1861, we'll see the Battle of Round Mountain occur. This engagement would pit pro-Confederate Creeks, Choctaws, and Seminoles, along with some Texas cavalry against Creeks and Seminoles who sided with the U.S. government. To set up the strategic situation, remember that there was a real split in the region. Many believed that the Confederate government would allow for rights that were denied by the United States. Those who still wanted to side with the current administration would attempt to leave the territory. And those individuals who were leaving the territory were being led by Apo Thaleahola, a Creek chief who had been around history for quite some time. He had actually fought against American troops during the Creek Wars in 1813. He was also a leader during the Trail of Tears and actually fought against the removal of the Creeks from their traditional homelands. Despite protesting treaties and fighting against the treaty party, eventually the removal was inevitable. Landowners in Georgia and Alabama were forcing the removal of Creeks among other tribes. It was before their trek west that Apatheleahola fought against Lower Creeks, who had sided with Seminoles during that conflict. He did everything he could to make sure there was an opportunity for 8,000 individuals who made their way to Oklahoma. This forced removal had left a bad taste in the mouth of Apatheleahola, who was in his 80s at the outbreak of the war, but still an effective leader, as well as a powerful speaker. A general distrust of the large landowners from the southern states led for his distrust of the Confederate government, which makes sense being led by mostly large southern landholders. So in his mind, the same individuals are leading the Confederacy that kicked him out of his lands, and, you know, that sparked the Trail of Tears, right? So... That makes sense. Either wanting to remain neutral or fight against the Confederate forces, the Loyal Creeks would reach out to Washington for assistance. Lincoln would answer in the form of direction to Kansas for safety and supply. It was to stop this movement north that sparked the Battle of Round Mountain, the first battle in the Trail of Blood and Ice campaign, to decide the allegiance and control of Indian territory during the war. Commanding the Confederate forces was one Douglas H. Cooper, uh, 
born in 1815 in Mississippi. He had served in the Mexican-American War under Colonel Jefferson Davis, performing well for the Mississippi Rifles. If you recall, that was the unit that Jefferson Davis commands during that war. When Davis served as Secretary of War under Pierce, Cooper was given a post as an Indian agent. During this time, he actually led Chickasaws and Choctaws against hostile Comanche raids. At the outbreak of the war, Cooper would be given orders to protect and secure Indian territory for the Confederacy. Stopping the northward migration of the pro-federal forces would be the first step. Cooper's combined force would attempt to catch the fugitives, but their advance column was surprised by Apo Thaleahola's forces and engaged in a fighting retreat. The Confederates would attempt to counterattack, but the loyal forces were able to escape by setting a brush fire. Cooper would not pursue, claiming victory after having pushed the Federal forces further north. Casualties were light, although Cooper claims to have inflicted over a hundred on the pro-Union Creeks. This claim may be false, though, to pump up the magnitude of the victory. The slides would clash again in December, continuing the battles for the territory. I would like to go over some of the conflicts on the frontier that would happen prior to the war between the states. This would be important to understand the mindset of the military moving into the conflict. I think we have framed that well when talking about the Mexican-American War, and we will have a segment about the experience of key figures in the Civil War in a future episode. Trust me, I have not forgotten that. In a little bit of time, I will have that episode segment for us. Anyway, I like to think that most people know about Custer and the Little Bighorn. That's a big ask, I know, but that would be after the Civil War, so that's okay if you are unaware of that. It's probably the best known conflict with Native peoples. These are not quite so well known, but hopefully we will learn a little more about the situation in the West and the Pacific Northwest, and it will give us a good idea of the type of combat that some of our commanders are going to be used to, and some of them might be trying to employ tactics that they have learned that might translate or might not translate, depending on the situation during the American Civil War. Pretty much most of the conflict we'll talk about has to do with encroachment into the lands of the tribes who occupy them. We can take a look all the way back to the Ohio Territory settlement, which started happening, sparking the campaigns that would lead to fallen timbers. Gold gets found in the Black Hills, which leads to a war with the Lakota. And yes, that would be Custer. So we spotted that gold star for today. So yes, rightfully so, the indigenous populations get a tad upset when a sweaty, bearded guy shows up and starts digging around in your dirt. The beginning of our story is no different today. If you recall from our introductions, the territory that comprised the modern states of Oregon and Washington were contested and actually shared for a period of time with the British. In the grand scheme of things, if you think about the area, it's not been part of the country for very long by the 1850s. Relations would start off really positive, with good interactions in that region when Lewis and Clark showed up. Remember, though, there was a migration out west along the Oregon Trail, with settlers arriving in that territory, and not, as it turns out, because they heard they could get a good earthy pinot there. The U.S. military would have to travel out that way in order to provide protection. 
It would not be long before there would be encroachment into the lands of the native peoples. These tribes being mostly the Yakima, Walla Walla, and Coeur d'Alene, among others. There had been hostilities in 1856 with sporadic conflict all the way until 1858. It was in that year where things would come to a head. The murder and harassment of miners wishing to take advantage of the natural resources in the region would spark a military expedition to provide protection. Commanding a group of around 160 military personnel was Major Edward Steptoe. Steptoe was a native of Virginia and attended West Point before serving in the Mexican-American War. He was attached to Winfield Scott's force from Veracruz all the way to Mexico City. The experienced officer would be led by his Nez Perce scouts in the direction of Colville, near where the miners had been ambushed. His force would pass through friendly territory before being noticed by bands of the tribes who were eager for combat. Steptoe, to his credit, would do well to defuse the situation by explaining their mission and that it was peaceful. Illustrating the somewhat disputed nature of these regions, we see a Jesuit priest who had established a mission attempt to broker a deal. When a Nez Perce scout slapped a potential hostile and called him a liar, battle would seem imminent. As you can imagine, that kind of thing would have been not gone well in terms of keeping everybody calm. A running fight would commence, eventually with the Americans sheltering on a rocky hill. The U.S. troops were outnumbered nearly 8 to 1. With the ammunition running low and having sustained casualties, the situation looked bleak. Escape in the night seemed to be the best course of action. Supplies were abandoned and the dead buried. Even a mountain howitzer was dismantled and buried to prevent capture. Being led by the Nez Perce in the darkness, the Americans quietly slipped through the ring of hostiles. So effective was the departure that part of the American pickets did not even know the forward parts of their comrade had started their retreat. Once away from the enemy camps, the Americans would ride hard throughout the night. Apparently, a group of Coeur d'Alene's would find out that their foe had slipped away but rather than raise the alarm, they were more interested in taking the supplies. Steptoe and his men eventually make it to safety. A response would be necessary by the U.S. government. General George Wright was assigned with the task of bringing the hostiles to heel. Wright had served against the Seminoles and in the Mexican-American War. He had actually fought in the territory a few years prior. During the Civil War, he will be the military governor in Oregon. Wright would set out on an effective campaign that culminated in the Battle of Four Lakes in 1858. It was at this battle where warriors were put to rout via a saber charge conducted by U.S. cavalry. After the expedition had inflicted casualties with little loss to themselves and established a new fort in the hostile territory, the tribes were brought to the negotiation table. Wright would set out on a retribution mission and hang several of the more notorious chiefs and warriors who had conducted raids against miners and the U.S. military. During this time, the howitzer and the buried men from Steptoe's expedition were recovered. Despite his brutal tactics, Wright was able to subdue the Yakimas, Coeur d'Alene, Palouse, and Walla Walla among others. Almost immediately prior to the Civil War, we also have the Battle of Pyramid Lake in modern-day Nevada. It was here that Nevada settlers would face off against the Paiutes of this region. And while it does not contain the U.S. military, it does show that a military presence would be needed. Volunteers from several Nevada cities, including Virginia City, among others, would form an expedition as a response to the burning of a building and murder of white settlers. 
Reasons for the attack were unclear, although it did include the capture of a Paiute woman, which apparently did not go over well with the Paiute warriors as one could imagine. The volunteers were drawn into an ambush and pursued by the Paiutes with deadly arrow and rifle fire. The lack of discipline in the volunteer unit would show in a mad dash retreat with little effort in making a stand against their pursuing foe. The Nevada men also were hindered by not having a clear-cut commander. The man who was the impromptu commander of the force would be wounded in the fight, and an excerpt showing the brutality of the combat would call out to an oncoming Paiute he knew, saying, I am your friend. The warrior would respond too late now before dispatching the unlucky man. When all was said and done, at the very low cost to the Paiutes, they actually inflicted almost 50 fatalities on the white men in a force that contained less than 200. As a response, the famous Texas Ranger Jack Hayes would show up, take command of 500 volunteers, and some 200 regulars sent from California in May of 1860. Hayes would engage the Paiutes in the same area as the first battle of Pyramid Lake and defeat them, killing 25 warriors. Similar to the actions we just discussed from Washington, this would effectively end any kind of threat that the Paiutes would pose in Nevada, thus opening the territory for future settlement. I would like to drive down further south and talk about an incident in the southwest. We have already mentioned the threat the Apaches posed to the Americans, having already been a menace to the Mexicans and natives of the newly acquired territory post-Mexican-American wars. While this is a smaller engagement, I think it will illustrate further the need for a larger military presence in the West. We have already mentioned that tribes like the Apache were at first excited by the Americans and their war with Mexico. Harder to understand was the conclusion of hostilities. Mexicans and those in Apacheria had been at war for many years, conducting raids and taking slaves on both sides. So a brief ending of the war was not ideal. Their way of life would continue regardless of a new presence of the U.S. military. In March of 1854, a troop of U.S. dragoons under John Wynne Davidson would pursue a raiding band of Hikarias near a village called Sienguia. And that is probably not how you pronounce that, but uh, give it my best shot there. Good college try. After approaching the Apache camp, the Dragoons were challenged. Davidson would order an assault. The Hickorias would use a feigned retreat tactic and swing around to hit the few troops left behind to protect the horses in the rear. The Dragoons would find themselves encircled, taking arrow fire and running short of ammunition. Eventually, after being harassed for some distance, Davidson was able to get his men to safety, although at a cost of a little over 20 dead and around the same number wounded. Apache casualties are unknown, but likely less than the Americans. I think we have a good idea of the kind of combat through some eyewitness accounts. The Indians, in a moment or two, made a charge on us from three sides at once. We repulsed them again and were then ordered to screen ourselves behind any trees or breastwork that we could get. We surrounded the horses in a sort of circle, and while in that position, the Indians made two more charges on us from three sides at once. We drove them back each time. There were sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes half an hour, elapsed between these charges. Afterwards, they would charge together from sometimes one side and sometimes another. The men from one side would go to the other, where the Indians were charging to assist in repelling them. We repulsed them every time. We fought at that place from an hour and a half or two hours. We lost some men there and killed some Indians. I saw two Indians fall myself. Here we have another uh, account of the retreat of the Dragoons. The moment we reached the summit of the mountain, they attacked us. There was an engagement of 10 minutes. The command after this engagement changed its direction to the left. 
we were then moving on the ridge of a mountain. We had moved but 20 or 30 rods from when we had our first engagement on top of the mountain when the Indians attacked us in the rear. The wounded men were then placed with the horses and the others defended the flanks and rear. Moved slowly in the manner for nearly half a mile, being attacked several times by the Indians and going that distance, but they were repelled each time by the soldiers. And then we have actually a final quote here. At the end of that distance, we came to where the mountain led to a deep ravine or canyon, when and where the Indians appeared to make their great charge and closed in upon us. The charge was also repelled. Captain Davidson was also wounded at this time, and also several men who were standing close beside me. Captain Davidson then spoke so as to be heard by all around and said, Don't get excited, men. Keep cool. I have often been in worse places than this. And this, is, this isn't this is part of the quote, but I, I'm sure that probably <laughs> was not the case, but uh, we can continue. The shower of arrows at this point had been so great that the ground had become completely strewn with them. The fighting men at this time were but few in number, as the majority of them had been wounded before reaching this point. And I heard those defending the rear and flanks complaining that they were completely wearied out. Captain Davidson then called for his horse, which the bugler was leading, was brought to him and ordered the command to mount and move on. Then commenced what I considered a retreat from the Indians, and an eyewitness must have acknowledged that we were beaten by over numbers and hard fighting. As we reached the foot of the hill, which was some 40 yards in height, I turned in the saddle and saw on the brow of the hill which we had left a large body of Indians. There must have been 60 or 70, and also others on the two flanks, who were making the best use of their arms that they could against us. After following the ravine some hundred yards, or near that distance, I saw two Indians by themselves. To the right of the ravine, one of them fired his piece and struck the crop of the horse in front of me. This was the last of the Indians that I saw. I think we can go ahead and pause there. Hopefully, we now have a better understanding of some of the actions in the West that forced there to be a larger military presence in that area prior to the war. It is also good, as mentioned, to understand some of the experiences that our officers in the Civil War have received prior to the firing on Fort Sumter. It is also interesting in checking in with the battles in Oklahoma that would decide who would control that territory. I think we have a little better of an idea in what we mean when we say there is a civil war inside a civil war, like some kind of violent Russian nesting dolls. Next week, we're going to pop back down to Pensacola briefly. It will also be a good opportunity to have a rundown of another conflict that will define our proceedings, one in which Abe gets his brief military experience, the Black Hawk War. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show will be greatly appreciated. Questions, comments, or concerns, all are welcome. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.